The formation of black color through the tan and iron reaction is one of the oldest and most widely used techniques for creating patterns on cellulose-based fabrics. You can find that in uh, African traditions. So this is a modern, modern bogoro with the two types of tannins. So the, the pale one is a kind of uh, like garnet tannin or myrobaron tannin, so uh, hydrolyzable. And the dark one comes from uh, condensed tannin. In some traditional dyeing techniques, such as Bogolan Fini in West Africa, cotton fabrics are pre-treated with a decoction of leaves and twigs from the Ngalama tree. Anogasis leocarpa, a member of the Combrataceae family, the same botanical family as the Myrobalan trees used by Indian dyers. The dyeing processes show remarkable similarities. African artisans alternate between soaking the fabric in tannin solutions and drying it in the sun to ensure the tannins bind to the fibers. The process continues with the collection of special iron-rich mud from specific locations along the Niger River. These areas, which flood during the rainy season and dry out later, create unique conditions. As water lilies decay in these seasonal lakes, they release gallic acid a crucial agent in the Bogolan process. Gallic acid dissolves metal components in the soil, particularly ferrous oxides from the laterite-rich red African earth. This reaction creates grayish-black mud, visibly distinct from ordinary river mud. Artisans recognize these gray patches as signs that the chemical reaction is already underway. The collected mud is then used to paint intricate designs onto the fabric. These motifs are preserved through careful washing with a mixture of local plant-based soap and fruit extracts. This fixes the designs, ensuring that the dark patterns remain intact while the rest of the fabric is exposed to the sun. Once the designs are set, the mud is washed off. But the iron tannin reaction has already stained the fiber permanently in the areas where the designs were painted. After the mud-based motifs have been fixed and washed, Artisans may further enhance the design by selectively bleaching parts of the fabric. This is done using an alkaline solution, such as potash, traditional, derived from wood ash and historically used for bleaching, caustic soda, a stronger alkaline substance. To add reddish-brown hues, artisans apply catechin-rich plant extracts from trees such as Kaya senegalensis, African mahogany, or Linnea microcarpa, sumac family, after the iron mud treatment. Catechins interact with iron-modified fibers, oxidizing when exposed to air and sunlight. This oxidation process shifts the colors toward warm reddish-brown tones, creating a rich and dynamic textile pattern. So, it was a combination of tannins, and it is still in use, of course. And now, to the Shipibo textile practice in Peru. In Peru, so the, the Shipibo uh, from Peru, they have what they say, a mahogany uh, tree to give this condensed tannin, the same than a catch, you know, and then they react it with some mud. The Shipibo technique relies on direct dyeing with condensed tannins following a repeated cycle of dipping and sun exposure. The fabric is immersed in a tannin-rich solution, then laid out in the sun to oxidize. This process is repeated multiple times, always exposing the same side to sunlight. Once the oxidation phase is complete, the artisans collect mud from the river rich in iron to create their signature delicate patterns. The mud interacts with the pre-oxidized tannins, forming subtle contrasts and refined motifs on the fabric. These methods of working with tannins and iron-rich earth is likely ancient, possibly dating back as far as early leather tanning or the first weaving traditions. In China, I have found, you know, those very interesting double face of fabrics. Uh, this is coated with tannin and then the reaction in between tannin and iron. What makes this technique so surprising? The fabric appears black on one side and brown on the other, 
yet it is dyed using the same process. How is that possible? The secret lies in the interaction of tannins and iron, combined with a unique plant, Dioscorea serosa, yam. This plant, which is rich in tannins but not edible, is first turned into a decoction. The silk is fully immersed in this tannin-rich liquid, ensuring it becomes completely saturated. The dyers then use a cyclic process, dipping the fabric, exposing it to the sun, and repeating this step multiple times. With each sun exposure, oxidation intensifies the color, making the fabric progressively darker and richer. Once the silk has absorbed as much tannin as possible, the artisans move to the next step, applying iron-rich mud. They take ferrous river mud, stretch the fabric under tension, and carefully brush the mud over the surface using a broom-like tool. Here's where the Dioscorea plant plays another important role. Its gelatinous properties prevent the mud from fully penetrating the fibers. This means that only one side of the silk gets coated in the iron-rich mud, while the other side remains protected. As the fabric sits under the sun, the ferrous iron oxidizes into ferric iron, binding with the tannins already present in the fibers. This reaction gradually deepens the black tones on the treated side, while the other side retains its warm brown hues. The process is repeated multiple times, layer by layer, until the contrast between the two sides becomes beautifully distinct. The tannins in Dioscorea serosa are a key element in this transformation. This plant contains both condensed tannins, responsible for its rich color, and hydrolyzable gallic tannins, which enhance the iron reaction. The result is a stunning two-toned silk, achieved entirely through the interplay of tannins, iron, sunlight, and time. Well, in India, the reaction in between tannin and um, iron was very well developed. Like, for example, this is a modern uh, Kalamkari. So people are coating everything with the tannin from Mayorbara. And then on that, they could paint with the kind of ferrous uh, thick preparation with, uh, it is a sh raw sugar together with um, old iron, but when it is let at the air, it makes kind of vinegar together uh, with the iron, which is uh, dissolving the first component to make a first acetate. So I found very interesting because this is almost systematically combined with some red dyes. So this is from uh, Indian mother, Rubia cordifolia, but I have seen that in many countries um, whatever it is just woven out or um, printed, uh, in many countries the best reds are given by uh, mother family plants. So in Indonesia I have seen the Morinda root. Modern uh, Indian art here is, it is a block printing, but the block printing actually is um, made um, like that by uh, printing first, uh, uh, no, coating first the, the thin cotton fabric with the um, tannin and then printing the ferrous on it so you have uh, that black design and then um, putting everything in the alum so the background is modernized and then the white is made by uh, discharging with acidic solution. So we have more than two different types, aluminum and first, we have the tannin important for uh, some fixing process, we have the discharge. In Europe, the tradition of black dyers also has deep roots. Various iron-based solutions were utilized, including those derived from metallurgical slag or metal shavings collected from sharpening stones. At the Gobelins Manufactory in France, Dyers created black ink for shading colors in dye baths by mixing rusted iron, vinegar, or sour beer, and alder bark extract. By the early 19th century, iron acetate became widely used, but the initial tannin treatment was abandoned. Iron mordants were applied to washed and dried fabric, and black motifs formed directly in the dye bath. This new method required a different approach. Instead of tannin helping iron adhere to the fiber, 
the fixation depended on careful drying followed by a stabilizing bath, which insolubilized the iron compound while maintaining its ability to absorb dye. This resulted in a durable black shade resistant to washing, friction, and light exposure.